Welcome everybody for our third public lecture of Place Making Nena uh, today. Uh, please, just as usual, we will ask you all to make sure that your microphone is mute, that you use the chat section to ask questions during the presentations, and also that you know that this session is recorded and streamed live on Facebook. Um, if you have any inquiries, you can email us at placemakingmena at gmail.com. And of course, maybe today we are facing some troubles with internet. So we'll try and we are uh, looking uh, to, to fix that. Meanwhile, we hope that you will, can understand if there is any interruption, we will try to keep it going. So as a presentation, we try to do and to present who we are first. Uh, we are a platform gathering partners and experts from the Middle East countries, uh, professionals, practitioners, activists, municipalities, and organizations uh, that we are all have in common place-making concept and approach and ethos to improve and activate public spaces in our urban areas. So our objective is to promote place-making as a people-centered approach to support local communities in transforming their public spaces into vital places. So we will work actively on making the built environment meaningful, healthier, and more human. We want to maximize facilitating creative patterns of use, paying particular attention to the physical, cultural, and social identities that define a place and support its evolution. And we want to promote free dynamic recreation of public spaces for cultural activities with special focus on socially fragmented cities and underprivileged neighborhoods, making public spaces much more inclusive to elderly people, to children, and to vulnerable communities. We want to promote placemaking as possible strategy for placemaking through social inclusion and interaction. So, and most of all, we always emphasize on that, we want to enhance volunteerism and civic engagement spirit through involving youth. So today, our extension, it's covering all the MENA regions um, from Algeria to Morocco, to Tunisia, to Iraq, to Lebanon, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, um, Jordan, Sudan, Syria, and Palestine, and Yemen. And these series of lectures are part of our first pilot project of incubating online within this context of the COVID, a project called Lilkol, and it's an online incubation project for placemaking. Yes. Uh, some, some people are waiting. Okay, so I just admit them all. Okay, please. Yeah, so we don't have to repeat again. Yes. So they are admitted. Okay. Yeah, and they can again follow on online. Um, so the workshop it's about placemaking as methodology to engage the community in improving their public spaces. So we have today five projects actually. We have one which is called Misahat al Hay in Jordan Amen by Sara Noir. We have a Hub for Hope in Egypt by Bena Foundation, represented by Russia. Um, and then we have Rehab Placemaking in Lebanon by Kawasar and represented by Billy Aboujoud. And we have uh, a project from Studio 26 Degree, 26 Daraja, from uh, Khartoum, uh, Sudan, by Tesneem Gafar. And we have a fifth one, which is actually an urban design studio by, uh, in Lebanon by the, uh, Dr. Francesco. So these projects we will give you much more details after that. And what we had as lecture at the beginning, we had a lecture on transforming cities and public spaces through placemaking. We had already social and cultural aspect of public space in the MENA region. We had rehab placemaking Lebanon, placemaking art in uh, pieces in public spaces last uh, Friday. And today we will have with us Reem Bouhamdan in a lecture about placemaking and rebuilding collective identity, think global, act local. And we will have also with us Karina Zouin, the story of Kawakaba project that we are looking to hear more about it. And tomorrow, actually, because this week is much more tense and we are finalizing our uh, public lectures, it will be a presentation by Laila Zivar, Circularity, Refugeehood and Placemaking in Iraqi Kurdishan the Syrian refugee camp case, 
And we will have a presentation uh, by me. It will be very short, <laughs> coexisting through placemaking. And we have as well, they join us this week, is Modalité de Production des Espaces Publics et Nouvelles Pratiques de la Citoyenneté en Tunisie. Uh, this is Sondes Zair from Tunisia. And we will have public space in Greater Tunis to the test by sustainability and integration by Olfa Bin Midian from Tunisia. So tomorrow it will be also a very, very long uh, session. Today I'm happy to have Karina Zouin. Karina, she's an interior architect and holds a master's degree in landscape architecture. She provides courses in different universities in Lebanon, focusing on internal architecture, public spaces, and urban furniture design. As an activist of placemaking, Karina, she's involved in preparing and conducting different workshops in Lebanon and within the MENA region. She has recently worked on different conceptual landscape projects in a rural and urban context, adopting a participatory approach through involving local communities, municipalities, and NGOs. Karina has an extensive experience through her work in UAA, London and Beirut, and through participating in several workshops and many exhibitions and conferences related to design, landmarks, environmental architecture, and placemaking in Lebanon and abroad. And we have as well Wendy Bohamdan. She is a Lebanese architect, graduated with a bachelor degree in architecture from Academy Libanese de Beaux-Arts and a master's degree in sustainable architecture and landscape design from Politecnico di Milano in Italy. Reem believes in holistic approach towards sustainable architecture for the people and public space design to regain human connection. This had led her to develop her master thesis project in South Italy about placemaking and rebuilding collective identity, which was developed through a workshop done in South Italy along with local and international organizations, architects, stakeholders, and academic institutions. Currently, she's based in the Netherlands, working on project targeting sustainable architecture that can adapt to the fast changing need of the users, as well as wood construction and CO2 neutral buildings. So thank you very much for all joining us today. So I will give now, um, you know, the hand to, to Karina to start. Okay. Just a second. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, very good. We can share, see it very well. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. It's uh, with great pleasure that I can, I will share with you the story of Kaukaba today. Uh, thank you, Insaf, for introducing my uh, introducing me. <laughs> so uh, I will skip the introduction. And uh, so we will start uh, with a small introduction of the current situation in uh, Lebanon uh, after the Syrian refugees uh, fled to Lebanon. We will introduce Kaukaba and why we chose Kaukaba. Uh, and we will have a small introduction about public space and uh, placemaking. Then we will introduce the project that, uh, we worked on and we will uh, we will take you through all the steps uh, we undertook and finally show you the results. Um, after that, we will have an open uh, discussion session. Hello, Francesco, you cannot hear me. We can hear you now. It's a, we, we heard you actually till the end. So um, I, I said already that we have internet uh, disturbance today, but you just, yes, the voice will come uh, on time. Yes. Okay. So um, just a quick uh, introduction of placemaking for placemaking. Placemaking is a collaborated process uh, by which we can uh, improve uh, and uh, shape public spaces uh, by making it a better place where the people of the community can get closer and, uh, uh, and give um, what happened in Lebanon in 2003. Uh, over 1.5 million Syrian refugees uh, fled to Lebanon, uh, where the biggest uh, population, where you can see here, uh, um, 
um, were uh, settled in the Beka and in uh, North of um, Karina, you are interrupted. Sorry for interrupting you. I think your screen uh, the resentment of the Lebanese people towards the situation in Lebanon, the economical problem, the unemployment, and the risen prices. Mm -hmm. The problem is particularly important in the uh, is with Syrian refugees and children. Can you see the slides? Uh, no? no, we are still stuck in placemaking, making pleasant places. We are still in, in slide five. Okay. So just take your time, it's, there is no pressure, just that the internet can come back. If you want to refresh, yes, here we go. So now we are on slide six, Karina. Do you want to have uh, to refresh your screen again? I think we kind of, it's frozen now. I don't know if you can hear us or not. Hello. Yes, Karina, we have you. Yes. Hello. Yes. We have you. Yes. Yes. You have you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Did you lose my uh, my slides, or where are you now? Uh, we we have to share again. I think you have to share again your presentation, and uh, okay. we will tell you. I think the internet it's a bit difficult today. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> so, of course, you can start sharing again your presentation, and um, I will be here to tell yes. you if it goes or not. Yeah? Okay. Yes. So it should work now. Mm -hmm. You should be on slide uh, uh, seven. Uh, we are in with slide the title about the Syrian, the Syrian refugees, refugees in, Lebanon. in Lebanon. Yes. The Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So as we said, we, that um, the, there was a problem with the, when, when, the Lib when the Syrian refugee fled to, uh, to Lebanon and mostly in the Beka. <coughs> so uh, to help these, uh, uh, these uh, areas, many international NGOs along with local authorities have worked on projects to increase uh, the social cohesion between the refugees and uh, the, the Lebanese. Uh, why did we, uh, how did it all start? Why, uh, at, uh, as a local urban designer and work uh, for a Dutch NGO, a place in a rural area in the Beka of design, uh, so the approach was to uh, work with the community uh, and the decision makers 
and uh, to create the, uh, uh, public spaces for the people in the village. After several researches of the, in the area to see what, uh, what uh, village we, we, have to, we can choose, uh, we, met, uh, many, uh, we met a lot of municipalities and at the end we settled for Kaukab al Arab. Uh, so um, how did we come along to choose uh, Kaukaba? Uh, Kaukab al Arab is in the West Beka of Lebanon, as you see in the map here. Uh, and it is uh, at an altitude of 800 meters above the sea level. It's renowned for its uh, proud people, rich history and agriculture, as well as that it belongs to the uh, <coughs> LMT trail, which is the uh, Lebanese mountain trail. Uh, but Kaukaba was facing uh, a very serious so social economic crisis. And uh, the large amount of uh, Syrian in, uh, refugees was not helping uh, the situation. Um, so uh, let me first uh, let's go back, let's go and see about the social aspect in Kaukaba. Approximately one thousand Syrian refugees uh, were living in this community. Uh, it's nearly the equivalent of uh, the same number of people uh, in Kaukaba. So it was like 50-50. Uh, the two communities uh, didn't want to interact due to uh, social cultural differences. So when we visited uh, Kaukaba uh, and we talked to the people, the, Syrians, the Syrian refugees were mostly confined in their homes. Uh, the children uh, were playing but just very close to the, to the houses and uh, they were avoiding, you know, to interact with the villagers. Later, when, when the Syrian community was invited also for the, to participate at the workshop, uh, uh, they, showed, uh, they showed up very, in a very, very small and shy attendance. The Lebanese uh, insecure, Uh, Karina, we lost you again now in the slide uh, 12, yes, or I think 11. So um, it's why Kawakba in the slide. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you, uh, can you repeat from that slide? Yes. Yes, uh, please. Yes, repeat from that slide. Okay, I will repeat from that slide. Thank okay, you. so approximately 1,000 Syrian refugees were uh, living in Kaukaba. It was nearly the same... Uh, number of people uh, in the uh, loc uh, local number of in Kaukaba. So it was 50-50. The two communities did, uh, did not interact at all due to social cultural differences. And when we, we visited the village uh, and we talked to the people, uh, the Syrian were at home. Uh, and uh, or to interact with the uh, at the workshop, um, uh, a very small amount uh, was there. The Lebanese and the Syrian community were feeling angry uh, uh, angry, unsafe, uh, both of them, uh, unhappy because of this difficult coexistence. So we really... So uh, we lost you again in, at the last time when you're saying that the coexistence was very difficult between the Syrian and the um, Lebanese. 
uh, both of them, they were very angry and happy. Um, and then we lost you again, uh, Karina. So let's see, maybe Karina, she has, uh, yes, I think she lost her internet connection. We'll try to wait for her like for two minutes and then we should have her again. Okay, so Karina, she's back. Yes, Karina, and you unmute your microphone. <laughs> Here we go. No, yeah, take your time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we will be waiting anyway. Okay, is my, is my screen shared? Uh, not yet. Screen I think shared? you have, we have around two, like around 30 seconds all the time of delay when you talk, you see, and things come. So uh, sometimes the voice is faster than the slide itself. Um, so let's see, let's, let's uh, share again, yeah, share again. And then I'm, I'm also, you know, trying to put on the chat uh, some of the key messages that you want to, to say. So we arrived at uh, when you're talking about the coexistence between the, both the refugee and the host community. The two. Yes. Okay, and then I said, Yes, and um, uh, about we, we, I'm talking now about Kaukaba that is in the uh, Lebanese mountain trail mm -hmm. of uh, of Kaukaba. Yes. Can I continue now? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, another aspect. Is the archaeological sites site by the rock on one of the, the village uh, hill? Uh, they have uh, it, it goes back to Neolithic uh, time. It is uh, famous for its renowned vineyards. Uh, always uh, offered us. Uh, from his uh, vineyard uh, this time to uh, uh, to give us boxes of uh, <laughs> of grapes to take them back home and share them. they have used for uh, to make olive oil and uh, consume olives they, the, 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 the trees are uh, amazingly old around 4,000 years old. So in summary, after uh, doing the small research about Kaukaba, uh, we, want, we wanted to create a public space uh, which will address all the social, economical and ecotourist aspects. But of course, among all, it needs to be uh, a pleasant uh, place for everybody. Uh, so creating place, uh, pub a public space for all in Kaukaba, where the two people, where the two, where the people of the two communities can get together, relax, and let the children play together, uh, get to know each other, enjoy, uh, will make the village much more pleasant for uh, uh, its inhabitant and more welcoming for the tourists, as we said, because Kaukaba receive a lot of tourists because uh, it's in the Lebanese mountain trail. Uh, as per Jan Gale, the famous, the famous uh, humanist architect, uh, he said about uh, the public space that it is about all about improving the quality of life for, Leban for uh, people uh, living in, uh, in a place and by putting them at the heart of the planning. So uh, we really wanted to apply the philosophy of, uh, of Jan Gehl and uh, put the inhabitants in, of Kaukaba in the, in the center of our project and uh, let them uh, be involved in every step of the process. Uh, 
so, uh, so the final result, because the final result is for them. After all, you are creating these places uh, for them. Uh, I'm on slide 20. Perfect. Are you, are you following me? Yes, perfect. Okay. So uh, just a quick uh, introduction, a quick introduction of uh, public space. What is public space? It can be rural and it can be uh, urban space. It's an open space for everybody and for, e for everybody and it's everywhere. Uh, um, they are used by everyone for different purposes and at any different time. Uh, they are where people meet with each other, talk, eat and relax. It can be, uh, a public space can be a highway, a sidewalk, a street, a garden, uh, an empty, uh, an empty uh, space between, place between buildings. So, uh, and what does it do? What does the public space offer? It promotes the local economy. It, it uh, promotes the physical and mental uh, well-being of the community. It creates interaction. Uh, it promotes the sense of the community, which are all very important. Uh, so when uh, creating a public space, one should take into consideration first and above all the users and their needs, uh, uh, research the surrounding uh, of, this, of this place and the impact on its inhabitants and take into consideration, of course, the history of the place. Uh, these are some tips uh, from the PPS, uh, uh, some tips and guidelines about uh, placemaking, how to create an, uh, a good design for uh, placemaking. Keep it simple, uh, choose the right material, sustainability, cost, aesthetic, uh, engage the community, uh, plan for the people and not for the cars, make it accessible for everyone, etc. So now back to Kaukaba. Uh, on our first visit to the village, we were uh, welcomed uh, in a place in a square called the Makam, Makam Square, uh, by the, the inhabitants, the mayors, the members of the municipality, children, women, men of all ages, we were gathered under two beautiful old uh, oak trees and uh, uh, we had lunch there prepared by the women uh, using uh, their own uh, local product. Um, following the lunch, we had uh, a walk in the village where we met again some locals in front of their homes and on the streets. Some invited us to have coffee, even to rest. And, uh, but what was actually uh, noticeable um, is that uh, when the Syrian community, the community uh, seemed uh, shy and less comfortable with our uh, visit. So after a couple of days surveying the village, we could establish the following existing uh, main central places in uh, the village, in Kaukaba. Uh, first, you have the Makam Square where they welcomed us and we had lunch. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, peaceful uh, place, uh, but nearby is a Makam, which is a religious place uh, where an old and very respectful figure is buried. So obviously the square is amazing, but has some limitation to use. Another place also where people meet are the, is the municipality square. Uh, this, uh, this building uh, is uh, the building of the municipality was an old school transformed into a municipa the municipality today, uh, but with no modification to the building or its surrounding. And the high, you can see the high fences um, in the square that makes the square un uh, unwelcoming and uh, difficult access to it. A third uh, place also, the football playground, where, pe where the children meet. Uh, it, it's, a far, it's a place that is far from the village, so unsafe and difficult accessibility. And 
The other place where people can play, the children can play, is the actual playground of the school. So when, when there's no school, they, they cannot get access to this uh, playground. And uh, a small lot in front of the school where you have a, a, a car park sometimes, uh, some cars they can, they park there. And uh, I believe uh, that parking places is very sacred in this part of the world. So uh, <laughs> people build attachment to it. So I think we should do something about it because especially that this land is, uh, is for the municipality. Um, finally, the school road. Um, the school road, as you can see in the pictures, uh, the roads are, the sidewalks are unfinished and not safe. No signs, no lighting, nothing. And uh, it would really need uh, to have a new, re to be uh, redesigned. Are you following me? Perfect. <laughs> okay. So after visiting the village, we started our second part of the program, which is surveying, preparing workshops, talking, uh, doing questionnaires. To create great places, we will need to involve as many people as possible. Oops, I lost you. Um, you're still here. You're still here. Okay. We are in the work process and strategy. Okay, okay. So uh, what are the steps? The steps is listening to the people, organizing workshops, discussions, uh, discuss, discussing options and problems, collecting data survey, designing and planning, and the final result, uh, the site work. Uh, we organized uh, a first workshop between the community and our team to explain the objective of the project and to have them fully engage in the process. So this is an opportunity to share uh, ideas and uh, op opinions and uh, to understand uh, the challenges. Uh, the first, in the first part of the workshop, um, it was, the workshop was hosted by uh, the members of the municipality as well as the representative of uh, surrounded villages. So we invited uh, people from outside Kaukaba and we did a presentation about the key principles of uh, public space. This is the first part and the importance and positive impact of uh, public space. Uh, and in the second, um, so these are examples we show, uh, we showed uh, about public spaces. Uh, on the left pictures, we focused on the social aspect uh, of a place, creating sitting areas, shades, pleasant areas, etc. And on the right, you can see how the, uh, the uses and the activity uh, that is very important when you create a, a public space. Uh, so in the same place, we try to create as much possible different activities like walking, reading, relaxing, chatting, etc. Another example uh, also of uh, public spaces is uh, the sidewalk. So uh, easy access, uh, so accessibility and linkage. Uh, also comfort and uh, keep it simple, safe, uh, add trees when we uh, when we can and if we need and uh, so here is the uh, second part of the presentation uh, we started with a brainstorming session we created groups <clears throat> where the participants uh, share suggestions and gave us idea of how to improve the situation in the village. It was an opportunity for us to learn more about the local, uh, the local uh, customs and habits. And we introduced all the concept of a public play, uh, place, which I shared with you earlier. Uh, for the second workshop, so uh, more pro we did more projects it was a more project focused. So, um, and uh, 
with more details on, with the surveys and uh, we did some questionnaires. Uh, for the workshop results, after a very successful workshop where the community showed great interest in our project, um, we agreed on the following next steps. So we chose four existing places and we chose to improve them, uh, conduct more detailed survey to focus on efforts on the main places, organize workshop and present a detailed implementation plan with a conceptual design for the four places. The four places we're talking about are the municipality square that really needs to be improved, the main square, the street around the school that is unsafe and the playground that doesn't exist actually. Uh, so for the survey, people from the village attended uh, and were invited to help us. And uh, so uh, they were to gather more information uh, for the design. The co local community contributed very closely and they showed us really a lot of enthusiasm in our work. Uh, Afterward, after all, we're doing this uh, project for the village. So for the second workshop, uh, people of Kaukaba, locals and Syrians from different backgrounds and ages were invited to attend the, a presentation on the basic uh, ideas of public spaces that can be inserted in, in the project for the village. In the second part, the participation, the participant, participant uh, filled some questionnaires uh, so we can know more about their needs and, uh, and then we, it was followed by a discussion. So the way the questionnaire was conducted forced them into, into the process and made them realize uh, that the input uh, is valuable and can make really a difference. Uh, from this questionnaire, we realized that a very high level of seriousness and interest uh, was uh, implemented and this community needed really our project. Here are some results of uh, the questionnaire. Uh, more of more than 90% of the people uh, that participates to the questionnaire wanted uh, pleasant places, uh, places to meet and to get together because the only places where they could meet are in the homes or on the street uh, or very seldom in the Makam Square. Uh, they wished also to improve the, the roads, the sidewalks and to create a playground, a safe playground for the children and uh, implement more greenery and trees uh, in these places. We showed them some examples of uh, open squares for the municipality, also examples of, uh, of uh, sidewalks, safe sidewalks, where, where you can be, have greenery, trees for the shade, uh, sign roads, uh, um, lighting, uh, light, lighting, etc. The neighborhood square, they have a beautiful neighborhood square. Once you go up the hill, you have, they have a, a huge uh, square, but uh, that really needed uh, some, uh, some design. So we, uh, we showed them that uh, just simply by adding some uh, benches uh, can make all the difference. As for the playground, uh, they should be safe places. So uh, using fences, safe material and accessories is very important. We should not forget shaded areas also in these places for the parents. So, Kaukaba, the project. Workshops, talks, and uh, after the workshops and the talks uh, with the inhabitants uh, and after listening to their stories, uh, this led us to draw a program uh, that 
should respond to all their needs. So our mission was to create a ple pleasant places, okay, meeting places for, for these two communities, uh, so they can interact and get together and know each other. Uh, the mayor showed us a few spots where we could uh, intervene, and uh, that's where we finally decided on these uh, four uh, places. Okay, so now we have a clear program for designing these places. The first uh, intervention was uh, the municipality square. Okay, you can see here the aerial, aerial picture. Um, this is uh, the municipality square here, and you can see how the fences, the fences, are really closing and this. It was open on the road, and uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, we designed some, uh, some trees, and uh, this is the final this is the vegetation, and this is the final result. So we painted the building just to give it uh, a better look. And we planted some trees. This is just one week uh, after the, it was finished, so uh, the trees are not very healthy yet. And you can see here how the space is open uh, to the road. The second uh, intervention was in the main village here. Okay, we just uh, we just um, okay. So. Uh, sorry, I had the problem with the slides. So here, uh, this is the main main square, okay? And uh, in the main square, we added a, a, a big tree in the center with benches for people to get together. The school street also, we showed them how with planting some trees and adding uh, signals, they, it can be safer. And finally, the playground where it was a parking place and now it's a place for, play, for children, uh, a safe place for people uh, to play. Thank you. So finally, the Kaukaba project was adopted as a pilot project uh, because we were able to achieve a great success with, this, with a low budget. So if you have the chance to visit Kaukaba, uh, one day you will see this, the community, the two communities gathered uh, in these places, which is really uh, great. Uh, the Syrian Aless Shai, uh, while respectful to the habits and culture of the local community and the Lebanese community are more tolerant and open to their Syrian uh, neighbors. So I can say um, with a lot of confidence that uh, this was a successful project. At the end, I, I want to share with you the quote uh, of uh, one of the quotes of Jan Gain, uh, culture and climate differ all over the world. But people are the same. They'll gather in, in public uh, places if you give them a good place to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you very much for the, um, this presentation and presenting also your, your community uh, placemaking project and in a different context because you were facing two things. You were facing the fact that you are in a rural area, first of all, and second, that you're dealing with coexistence and with uh, trying to find a place where the host and refugee communities can both uh, participate in creating and improving uh, their surroundings and their public spaces. And I think you did wonderfully 
even without this uh, poor internet connection. And um, we have, I'm sure, a lot of people who are really would love to have some questions. Um, I would uh, suggest yeah. probably maybe to, if you want to combine all questions with the, for your presentation and Reem as well. Um, and then we would be able to have a debate uh, at the end of the session. So thank you very much. And now I will, um, I will give the hand to Reem if she's ready. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi, Reem. So, hello. Hello. So um, yeah. you can, of course, Karina, if you can um, uh, stop sharing the screen and that we give the hand to, to Reem to share hers. Thank you very much. It's a lovely, lovely picture to end the slides with. Here we go. Yeah, I had a bit of a technical problem at the beginning, but now it's all good. So it's we can fine. Start. It happens. <laughs> now that <it's> yeah. <laughs> The fact to do it online, it can happen even in real time. So um, yeah, you know, all our time. So no pressure at all. And you can start your presentation. Thank you can you. see my screen? Yes, perfect, perfect. OK, so um, today I will be presenting uh, the project I developed with a colleague of mine, Jose David Eras Barros, about placemaking and rebuilding collective identity, the case of Del Monte Calabro. Basically, I will be focusing on the research behind this project and the process uh, of working with the community of Belmonte Calabro and different local organizations in South Italy. Uh, I will start off my presentation by um, quoting the Carter of Public Space. Uh, public spaces are all places publicly owned or of public use, accessible and enjoyable by all for free and without a profit motive. Each public space has its own spatial, historic, environmental, social, and economic features. So why public spaces? Um, public space is basically where all of our life happens. It's uh, where we develop our behaviors, where we meet other people, where we learn from other people. And we have noticed, especially after this corona crisis, how much it is needed to, uh, to have a public space uh, to share for our physical and mental health as well. And uh, the Yan Habitat have defined several types of public spaces. Uh, mainly, I will be focusing on streets as public spaces for this presentation that include streets, avenues, squares, pavements, passages, and bicycle paths. So what is placemaking? Um, placemaking is a process and a philosophy that has developed uh, during the 70s as a reaction to the policies that were made in the 60s in the United States, which uh, detached the different functions. So for example, industries, businesses, residential, and this created uh, a lot of unnatural uh, urban spaces. So there was a need for, for some kind of intervention to regain this value of having a public space. Uh, so what makes a great space? I will go super fast because also uh, Roni have uh, explained these in the first session. So uh, basically a project for public spaces, um, like presented different categories to assess whether a place is great. And within each category, there are subcategories to assess the space and they are sociability, uses and activities, comfort and image, access and linkages. And they have also uh, provided a procedure of how to intervene in public spaces. And it's really important that this procedure is not a linear one. However, it's an ongoing procedure of um, uh, evaluating and re-evaluating the intervention that you're working on. And as well, there is a um, very important concept that they have developed, which is the power of 10 plus, where in each city there should be 10 places to go, and within each place there should be a minimum of 10 things to do for a place to be an active one. So how can an intervention in a public space rebuild collective identity, and what is collective identity? So a collective identity is uh, when we come together and as a group, we uh, manage some kind of a, like a common uh, behavior or a set of behavior. So this is the common identity, the collective identity. And the transformation of a public space only happens when you overlap like the identity of a space, the values and the aspirations of its users with the potential of the site itself 
and the challenges it provides. Um, so learning to promote diversity in a public space is first creating safe spaces, representing cultural symbols, engaging the community actively, of course, designing to stop discrimination, uh, integrating different users, locating public spaces to serve multiple communities, focusing on neighborhoods and programming educational and cultural activities. So now moving into the case study, uh, Belmonte Calabro is a small village in the southern part of Italy in the Calabria region. And um, we started working with the organization uh, La Rivoluzione delle Sepie, and uh, they have been developing several workshops since 2016. And it's uh, very interesting because uh, Lesepi is part of a very big network of uh, local and also um, international as well uh, organizations from educational and uh, uh, also uh, like uh, for uh, local uh, industries as well, like food uh, industries. And uh, during these workshops, of course, we had a lot of uh, uh, focus group discussions, talking to the people. Uh, it's a very uh, multidisciplinary team. So uh, we worked with um, a sociologist, psychiatrists, architects, urban planners, artists, graphic designers. And uh, there were a lot of interventions, uh, like uh, with temporary installations, uh, working with lighter, quicker, and cheaper. And we were asking the people, like, what do you think about this place? What are the negative aspects? What are the positive aspects? What is the memory of Belmonte Calabro that comes to your mind? And what is the image if someone tell you, how do you see Belmonte Calabro? What is the image in your head of, of this place? I will share with you a small video. I, one second. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> No problem, no problem, take your time. Okay. Can you hear? Yeah, Jordan Watch, Browsing, the fourth edition. Siamo molti di più di quelli che siamo stati ogni anno. Siamo arrivati a 80 partecipanti, tra partecipanti, organizzatori e ospiti. Nella settimana si dividerà in tre workshop: arte e comunicazione e autodistruzione. Tre inizialmente dei tessuti alla comunità. La comunità è costituita da chi vive per il monte attualmente, quindi possono essere i migranti, possono essere gli abitanti del luogo, chi è di passaggio, chi vive quotidianamente questo posto. Sì, è certo che per questa settimana noi siamo parte della comunità di Belmonte, però dopo di questo, ok, noi andiamo via, che succede per le persone di qua? La prima volta anche che abbiamo deciso di, di creare un intervento che fosse meno temporaneo, più presente, ma soprattutto che aiutasse ad aumentare questi, in qualche modo questi ritorni di questa comunità che noi chiamiamo effimera, temporanea, che però ormai si è affezionata a questo paese e che ogni anno diventa sempre più numerosa. Okay, uh, so what is interesting here is that after the set of workshops uh, of doing lighter, quicker, cheaper interventions, they realized that, okay, these interventions are working, but they are working for only this short period of time. However, later they are not achieving the purpose that they were aspiring for. So uh, there, there was like a need for a new strategy, how to intervene in this village. So that's why the idea of more permanent installations was necessary. And that's why the last edition was uh, designing a casa, like a base as a community living room and kitchen that is a permanent structure for people to meet. 
then we go to the um, regional analysis in Belmonte Calabro. And it's really important uh, to denote that Belmonte doesn't uh, work alone, but it's part of a bigger network of villages uh, within the region of Calabria that work together as well as an active uh, node in Italy, because all, in all of these villages, different activities happen along the year. Uh, so for example, if something happened in Amantea, all the people from these different villages go to this event that is happening there. So it's part of a bigger network. Then um, to understand the situation in Belmonte Calabro, you have to take, uh, to see the big picture, what is happening in Italy in general. So um, in Italy, there's a, um, like a phenomena or like a situation that there's a huge difference between the northern part of Italy and the southern part. Uh, that's economically uh, the opportunities for work and the opportunities of basically everything. So uh, there's a lot of internal migration from the southern part of Italy into the northern part, densifying these northern cities and leaving these uh, like southern cities to deteriorate within time. And that's, we see a lot of like uh, uh, difference between urban and rural population because people tend more to live in more uh, urban environments. And that is uh, why it is important for Italy, uh, for Belmonte Calabro, because the demography is changing. Uh, and all the young people have left the village to, to seek opportunities in bigger cities, leaving old people behind, which is now the local community. A lot of immigrants have crossed the borders into several uh, Italian cities on the coast, uh, southern Italian cities. So then there is the second uh, part of the community, which is the immigrant community. And there is as well the ephemeral community, which is us who come twice or three times per year for workshops, for different kinds of acti activities that is happening. So it's kind of a complex community and different target groups within this community. Um, we started with the destination analysis because it's really um, important to understand the context that you are working on because what works in one place most probably will not work in another place. So we overlapped a lot of analysis, historical analysis, views analysis, uh, solids and voids, what are the unused uh, public spaces within uh, Belmonte Calabro. We defined an, uh, a main axe that we call the carpet of the public. And along this axe, there were a lot of active nodes existing and uh, ones that were developed during the previous uh, workshop edition. And uh, Belmonte is like split into three parts. Uh, one part has a strong connection to the sea landscape. One part has a very dense urban fabric. And one part has a strong connection to the mountain landscape, which makes it as an object itself within the, the landscape as a whole. So after an, uh, like overlapping all of these uh, analysis, um, we thought that we need, we need to intervene in three different locations. One that has a strong connection to the sea, one in the urban dense landscape, and one in the um, location that is connected to the mountain landscape, and thus completing the activities that already existed within the main axe. And these interventions are Porta Terra, which is connected to the mountain, timeless and dense urban fabric, and Porta Amare, uh, which is the one connected to the sea land. Starting with the first place, I will go briefly. <laughs> of course, it's not the main purpose of the project. Place one, Porta Am Amare. And um, of course, we studied the historical elements present on site, the movements and accesses within uh, this site, uh, the statue of elements. So what are the things that are in intrusive on the historical elements present? And of course, the biodiversity and the sustainability strategies to intervene in this, uh, in this location. And what we wanted to achieve here is an experience, experience to, um, to interact with the different levels, with the existing topography, with the landscape. And we didn't want to force a certain um, function. However, the users can, they can, uh, like they can represent the function that they want. Like one day, uh, the main viewpoint can be for yoga or for a theater or for a public market 
So it's not a, a strict function that is happening there. And then it connects to an open exhibition area that showcases the different um, art pieces that we create throughout the different uh, workshops along with the community itself. And actually the, the old ladies of Belmonte play a huge role in making these art pieces, uh, connecting as well to um, semi-open exhibition area and then to the community garden uh, on, on the lower part. And here are some visualizations of how we stress on the historical part and something that is really not intrusive, but as well saying a lot because Belmonte itself is so strong in terms of landscape. So we wanted something that doesn't take away from the landscape, but give, like we want to see, we want to focus on what is already there. So um, uh, here is the extension of the uh, viewpoint and the interior semi-open uh, exhibition, as well as the community garden, where we um, focus mainly on local productions, especially the Pomodoro Calabrese. It's very famous uh, Calabria region for the tomatoes they produce. The second intervention is the uh, Porta Terra. And in this intervention, it's uh, the one connected to the mountain landscape. Um, it, it's a very disconnected uh, like location because even when you are in this piazza, uh, when you sit, you actually turn your back towards the view. So people are really not aware of the view. And it actually works on two different levels. So there are a lot of limitations. Uh, the first strategy was breaking this limit. And um, the idea was uh, in Italy, it's very uh, interesting, the concept of balconies because they are part of public space. So the idea was to extend the dynamic of the street into the public space and create like this kind of balcony. So when you are in this piazza, you are in this Belvedere, you are already like interacting with the people on their own balconies. So it creates this kind of interactive dynamic with the street and the buildings around it. The third intervention, which is uh, timeless, and it's uh, a completely different context because it's in the very dense urban fabric within the Monte Calabro. And um, what we did there is that we analyzed historical elements present on site. And that part is basically an abandoned um, like a building that is really deteriorated. And there are some uh, historical elements present there and a lot of wild vegetation. And we found value in that. So we, we didn't want to uh, intrude over these uh, elements, but we want to work with them. So uh, this intervention was inspired by Escher, uh, the Dutch artist, and uh, by Eduardo Tritoldi. Um, and it works like we created different platforms that work on different levels uh, to go around these historical walls and around the, um, the vegetation. And uh, it opens up when there are walls, uh, windows within the historical walls, it opens up to the view. And there are, of course, like new platforms to admire the view as well. So basically, the strategy in a nutshell is uh, talking to the community, um, thinking what are their aspirations, what is their memory, what are the, the, the things they hope for, then um, analyzing the situation that is already there. So what is the main acts? What are the activities happening there? Um, what are the things that have been developed during the different workshops? Then applying the concept of power of 10 plus. So where are the weak points present there? Where do we need to intervene? What are the things we need as programming? And uh, that's why uh, we, um, we add. So these three interventions are an addition to what activities that are already present there. And then linking the access, which is through the, the previous uh, done interventions that are lighter, quicker, and cheaper. And uh, to link the access with these uh, temporary structures. And uh, like, fortunately, uh, this project has uh, won the Isaac Arp Student Award for International Society of Urban Pl Planners for urban excellence and, and um, the learnings for MENA region. So what can we learn from all of this process uh, that can be applied in the Middle East region? Actually, in the Middle East, we have a really very strong sense of community and belonging. And people are mostly proud 
of, of their cultural background and, and yeah. So, however, it's not canalized into uh, sharing a public space. So that's where the actual uh, raising awareness of um, having like the importance of sharing a public space and having a common ground for people to meet and exchange uh, thoughts, exchange knowledge, and to be present together in a shared place. Um, then the like the rule, the principles, and the and the knowledge that the placemaking uh, uh, philosophy give us is a huge tool, actually, that can help us in the preparation uh, for interventions in public spaces. Uh, then, for public spaces to be inclusive, they should really be adaptable because even the the um, like the people are changing within time and their needs are changing as well. So what you think is working now might not work next year. So it's like an, a constant evolving, evolving in the needs uh, within a public space. And then uh, to understand whether placemaking methods actually work, we have to try. So it's a learning by doing process. You have to try, you have to see what are the weak points, what can be done better. And it's not, uh, it's not bad if it doesn't work from the, from the first time because nobody knows everything. So it, it has to be a trial and error process. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Reem, for this wonderful project and uh, another uh, type of placemaking project, actually, where we have much more an urban scale and uh, architectural design scale. Um, at the same time, I see uh, it's very nice to see also that you have been, you know, continuing the process of placemaking, that you realized and tried different tools at the beginning. And then the tools are also important to, to be reviewed, to be evaluated, to be also uh, adapted to different contexts and also the process because you keep saying the process and this is goes to your, your topic because it's about collective, you know, uh, knowledge transfer is a collective uh, effort. It's a collective uh, way of doing things. And this is needs time. Uh, we sometimes forget that the time is very crucial because also we need to have time to adapt, we need to have time to understand, we need time to interact, and um, how to bring the knowledge that you have as designers, urban planners, and other also practitioners, in a way to be confronted also the community or the inhabitant residents themselves, they have the, their own knowledge about the space and how they use it, and it's a kind of common space for you all. I think that at the end, it, it's it, you are part of, uh, this village, it's part of you as well, because exactly. you have been part of it um, in a team. I have, uh, just before we opening the question, I have a question from Roni. Um, he's here. Normally, you should ask them. <laughs> 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 Where are you, Roni? We are, we are, we are waiting for you. <laughs> so, um, he's here, but he, he, he's kind of, uh, I would say it. So, he said, um, I don't know if you're speaking Italian, Reem, but how much interactive tool can help us to communicate with the local community without knowing, talking the local language? This is for you. Actually, the local language really is a, um, is a limitation because, of course, intervening, and especially this type of, uh, of work, you really need to communicate with the, with the community, you really need to talk to the people. So knowing the language is a, is a big deal, actually. So, I mean, when it's uh, an international context, it, it, it would work eventually, because you will be getting involved somehow. However, of course, knowing the language will be a different kind of interaction, I would say like uh, because it's more personal it's more direct uh, you don't need someone intermediary between you and the people mm -hmm. so uh, so yeah i think it's really important uh, to to know the language but it doesn't mean that you cannot do it if you don't i would say i mean i have to learn italian because in italy it's a bit hard yes. <laughs> if you don't know the language but yeah Again, the language. So. I, would say, I would say also it's very attractive when you don't know the language because sometimes when you in the outreach strategies for the community, which I also how I define your first phase, is that sometimes, you know, being an external agent, 
leads to break up the ice much better because people will get the effort to translate for you. Sometimes you are a point, focal point for attention. So this is, could be also used um, very well uh, within that concept. Yeah, concept. and I mean, it's not only the language because also the cultural background, because for example, I come from Lebanon, uh, my colleague comes from Ecuador and we both work in Italy. So it's kind of like this situation that's this is a huge cultural exchange, but then it's the point, how can you lose your ego, let's say, as, a, as an architect or as a designer and really think deeply into the context. Yes. So it's, it's more of like, of course, our cultural background help a lot because what I know is, is different, for example, from someone in Europe would know or someone in, uh, in America would know. So this kind of cultural overlap is really rich, I believe. How to reach co-creation. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And here I have another from Rana Kashab. She said, how can the implementation be flexible to change functions with time? Uh, excuse me, can you please repeat? Yes, so she's asking, how can the implementation be flexible to change functions with time? Um, I mean, it's, it's all about programming. When you design a square, you think that the user experience would be going from point A to point B. However, when you really observe people, they really don't do that. They would create their own path. So the, the point is that uh, we're not talking about physical things. We're talking more about programming. Uh, of course, right now, also with physical structure and architecture, it's, it's totally adaptable right now. But uh, also an intervention with public space programming should play a huge role that it's flexible, the space. There are not much of limitations. So it can be, as I mentioned, for example, in the first intervention, it can be for a yoga, it can be for a theater, it can be for a public market. Um, so I believe it's a matter of programming and uh, like, um, having no physical limitations, let's say, and the design can, can enhance like, the possibility of having these different functions. How it could be polyvalent, but also, also allow some kind of freedom and restrictions because exactly. about dynamics yeah. it goes to forms. Um, of course, there is a lot of details because it's not only a projected ideas, it's also based on the participation, the outcomes of it, the observation, the use of tools in the right way, because it's a kind of also science. They are measurable. You can really see exactly the people interaction. You see the scope of it. You see you adapt it, etc. And of yeah. course, when we design at the same uh, moment, and here why also designers are important in such things, because we all the time think that placemaking is only about people. It's we support, we, we enter we kind of also be a mediator, but at the same time, we offering using our knowledge, the freedom and the way of how these things could happen. And this is basically how from space to place, uh, magic can, can, uh, can take place. Um, another, we have a question now for uh, Karina. I think Karina, she, you're with us. Where's Karina? Yes, she's here. So we have a question, let me find it, yes. So it's from Rumi again. How can participation improve interaction between different groups and enhance social inclusion? I will add mine. I'm asking uh, if the Syrians at the end of the project were much more enthusiastic than at the beginning. So these are two questions. Um, and of course, uh, we have a lot of uh, comments like lovely intervention. Thank you very much. This is all coming in the private. Uh, messaging for me so yes um, so as I said at the end of the presentation uh, <clears throat> when we went back and visited the place we realized that uh, the creation of these uh, public spaces uh, really helped uh, these people to get together uh, for example the playground uh, in the playground uh, the children uh, found a place where to play but also as it was only one place, this playground, so the two, the people of the two communities, the children of the two communities, yeah, they had to get together at any point, they had to get together and play together. So this is how the children uh, 
got together. And uh, as for the square, uh, this uh, really uh, lovely square at the end of the village, uh, also because uh, most of the, uh, the locals live there, but uh, also the, uh, some, uh, some Syrians also live in the unfinished houses uh, next to them. So they, they, they passes through this uh, square and you could see them. Uh, they were not shy anymore. I mean, we, we added some uh, benches and they were sitting on this, these benches. And uh, so you could feel that it was a bit more, a bit shy uh, when we saw them. Uh, you know, between the grown-ups, it's, uh, it's a bit, little bit uh, more difficult than with children. But uh, no, you could see this uh, interaction again between them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kerina. Um, we don't have any other questions. Uh, I think our audience is shy <laughs> uh, more and we, they might also send more question, um, uh, let's say uh, in a private. Here we have other messages, let me see. Okay, so here it comes. So we have a question from uh, Jose David Heras Barros. He said, hello, thank you very much. Both intervention, very interesting. One question for Karina. The interventions were very focalized for the specific plaza, etc. Was there any study about how all of these interventions connect to each other? And also as equal important, how all these helps to connect the village with the other villages or other regions. And uh, uh, we have Zahra from Lebanon. She said, my question goes to Karina as well. How did you choose the municipality square specifically? Okay, I will start with the second one. Why, how, why, did, I why did we choose the municipality square? Uh, I mean, the municipality is a very uh, important uh, uh, place in the, in the village. Uh, <clears throat> so the intervention there was very important. And uh, uh, the fact that we visited it uh, many times, we realized that uh, with this these big fences and this uh, uh, iron iron door that you had to open that was very heavy every time you have to go to this municipality you had to open it and actually uh, by opening by removing these uh, these walls and this uh, this fence uh, I mean people and, and and adding these benches also not only in front of the uh, of the municipality square but also on the road on the side road uh, you could see that this uh, really helped uh, the people to enjoy the place more. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the other question, the first question. Uh, the, yes, it's uh, the first question. Yes, how was, how was the in, in study about? Yeah. How these places on intervention, if they have a kind of broader uh, scaled um, perspective, like if they are connected with each other's and also okay. if these villages, <clears throat> will have an impact on other villages uh, surrounding. Okay, so um, if you remember one of the on one of the slides, on the first uh, workshop with the community, uh, we did uh, brainstorming and we brought the maps and uh, actually uh, the, 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 municipal, the village is focused, the, the people are living very close to each other in one, one place in the village and all the other lands are uh, agricultural lands. So uh, from the entrance of the, of the village, you pass through uh, this parking lot in front of the school, which is the playground, we, we, which we uh, improved it into a playground. Then we, you go through the sidewalk, then you, go, uh, you pass through the municipality. It's just one road. It's an artery. To, it's a, it's to the main, artery. so it's a line, it's one line that links this road, uh, links these places. Yes, 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 yes. So we see it's a, the same uh, kind of very strategic uh, acts in, within the village. So it has this uh, part of it. Thank you very much, uh, Karina. Thank you very much, Irene. I will share just my screen uh, at the end, uh, just to remind you that tomorrow, uh, we will have uh, four lectures. Uh, we will have three of them in English and one in French, and we will be providing translation. So we'll explain how things will work. So first of all, uh, we will have circularity, refugeehood, and placemaking in Iraqi Kurdishian, the Syrian refugee camp case uh, by Leila Zibar. And uh, we will have, after that, a presentation about coexisting through placemaking uh, by myself. Then we have by Sundas Zair from Tunisia, 
modalités de production des espaces publics et nouvelles pratiques de la citoyenneté en Tunisie. And we will have public spaces in greater Tunis to the test by sustainability and integration. And of course, uh, just to remind everyone that to, we will be updating the link for tomorrow for the lectures because of the English translation uh, that people can follow up. Uh, as well, I wanted just to tell you that we have our, to our guests, that we will have our Lilkol private incubation starting at 3 p.m. Uh, GMT, so 5 o'clock Lebanon time, and Netherlands time is at 4 o'clock. Um, and uh, through that, we will see also the results of their first sensorial, um, you know, uh, experience with their sites and looking forward for after the session and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.